A continuación, invito al señor Ian Hutchinson, director de SR Global Environmental Solutions, para dar inicio a su presentación titulada Desecho Minero y Manejo de Agua, Desarrollos Futuros y Tendencias. Ian Hutchinson ha realizado diseños y planes de cierre para diversas instalaciones mineras, incluyendo roca de desechos, relaves, pilas de lexiviación, sistemas de extracción y tratamiento de aguas subterráneas. Trabaja en proyectos principalmente en países como Canadá, Estados Unidos, Brasil, Perú y Chile. Un aplauso, por favor. Spanish. Um, the, I just talked to Eric and he said that 120 grams of gold was in the South African pavilion, so we can go and check it out after lunch. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, my, there's three of my co-authors here, Francisco and Erwin, so if there's any more detailed questions, we may ask them to, to respond to questions as well. Um, forward here. Okay. Here we go. Just, the, just looking forward, I know there's a lot of concerns about mining. There's been a lot of complaining by mining companies that life is difficult, and I understand that. But if you look at the population forecast, we are right now at about six, six and a half billion, uh, projected to go to 11 billion. And what's more importantly, as, as the population grows, the standard of living increases. The dark blue area is those people with a higher standard of living who have a higher metal consumption, need more electronics, etc., and their proportion increases substantially up to the year 2100. So there's no doubt in my mind that metals are here to stay and there'll be a, a continuing demand for metal mining as we move forward. Obviously, we have to be a lot smarter about it. The, just, just some quotes from, from some famous people. One thing I've noticed in mining is we can't solve the problems by doing things the same way we've always done them. We have to be innovative, we have to innovate, we have to think creatively. Um, and more importantly, I think, is you've gotta, we've got to learn the rules of the game. The rules of the game have changed. Things aren't like they were in the 70s or 80s when we all started in this business. And once you've learned the rules, you've got to play them better than anybody else. Mining is still a competitive industry, and there'll always be competition. So there's no point in, in complaining and whining about you know, lack of demand and lack of growth in countries. We've just got to learn the rules and play them better. Um, the other thing that's important, too, is, is, is by Cicero, that all small things start from, all great things actually start from small beginnings. We hear innovative things that are kind of sometimes a little hokey. I'm sure the first time somebody suggested we use cyanide to extract gold, they thought he was probably crazy. So we need to be aware, we need to keep our eyes open for any of these innovations that, that crop up and see how they grow. 90% probably won't grow, but there will be some that will make mining a lot better, more efficient in the future. Um, the other thing is, I'm mainly in the, in the sort of water and waste end of mining. It does play a disproportionate role Tailings dams are huge, waste rock piles are huge, water, water supply is becoming critical. So a lot of the attention mining gets is because of these, these features and we need to be very careful about them. This is just an example in South Africa of, the, of, of a tailings dam failure that, that resulted in fatalities. So let's not underestimate the importance of waste and water management in mining. Um, oops, where did this thing go? So, what, what we'll just talk about here is just some examples of where we get involved. We're trying to help the mining industry moving forward, um, being more, more creative, um, more sol solutions oriented. These are just some examples of what's going on. It's by no means a complete expose of all the creative stuff that is being done in mining as we, as we get better at it. Uh, the first two topics will be just on mine planning. Um, 
sort of a more, more of a formalized integrated mine planning process that gets us to better solutions faster. Uh, some ideas on recent ideas on tailings facilities optimization, how we get more storage out of existing facilities, and um, some co disposal uh, discussions that is becoming more and more prevalent over time. And then acid rock drainage control measures. As the ore bodies go deeper, we're getting more and more sulfide, so acid rock drainage control is going to become an increasing issue to deal with. So, first topic was the mine development planning. Um, why just the, this is an example, I'm going to work a couple of examples just to show you how, how it works. Um, this is a, a mine in um, Argentina, um, which had a lot of complicated um, issues. Um, so what we did is we, we sat down with the mining company and we laid out all the options they had. They could develop the mine on site, they could do, they, they couldn't do cyanidization on site because it was part of a city, uh, it was in the city boundaries, but they could do cyanidization off site. But they could do flotation on site, um, and then they could haul off site, or they could haul all the rock off site and do the processing off site. They could, um, off site, they could do flotation followed by cyanidization, or they could do roasting. So they had a myriad of options. And each one had obviously different net present values, which were easy to calculate. Each one also had a slightly different social impact and environmental impact. So we helped them use this um, planning tool to, to kind of work through the options. So basically what, what the planning tool does is it, it's, a, it's a system, a decision-making system and you select the parameters that you think are important, and obviously cost is important, and that gets a box on the decision tree. Um, environmental parameters are important, social uh, parameters are important, operations, risks, uh, construction risks, operating risks are all important parameters. So you build them into a, a decision tree like this, and then you break each one out, like on environmental effects, you may be concerned about uh, um, land, land uh, terrestrial fauna, uh, you may be concerned about uh, carbon emissions and stuff like that, so you can break it out, further break it out. And, and, and so you end up with a complete list of all the parameters that are important to you in making a decision of which one of those particular options to select. Now, the important part about this planning process is in setting up this decision tool, these decision trees, as you see one here, you integrate the whole team. So you get your whole mining team involved. It includes the financial people, includes the technical people, the, the process folks, the mining guys, um, uh, your, your uh, environmental coordinators, the, the folks that deal with social license and that stuff. So you get people to integrate, bring the ideas to the table. You put all the ideas into the decision tree, and then you get them to work with you to rate these various parameters. And I found it to be mostly a very, very effective team building exercise internally in the mine. You get people to see other people's opinions and everybody's, you know, trying to come up with the best ranking of these alternatives. So it's a very, very good uh, team building effort. Obviously, once you've done it all, it gives you a great deal of confidence that you've actually taken everything into account in your decision making. So you can go to the public with a lot of confidence saying, look, I've looked at all these issues. I've looked at the issues you've had. I've looked at the issues I have. I've looked at the issues the government has. I've integrated it all, and this is the best solution. Um, now, we use computer models to help with this. You don't have to, but they make it easier to use. And the output is, is comes in graphs like this. Now, if you remember all those different alternatives, they rank on the right, uh, sorry, on the, on, on the left. And you can see which scheme came out on top and which scheme comes out on the bottom. Then if you want to know why the one was ranked on top, you go to the chart on the right that shows you the major decision criterion, why it was chosen. You can see from a project economic standard point of view, it had the highest net present value. From a social point of view, the important thing there is it had similar social impacts as all the others. So it immediately gives you, gives you some confidence that you can deal with the public and say, look, all of these schemes have a similar effect. Um, environmental, 
it does score a little lower on environmental. It had a few more environmental effects um, than the others. And then the, but it did have a better effect on the local economy. So again, you can go and say, look, there is a small environmental effect. My blue, dark blue bars are smaller, but my um, local economic bar is big. So we're, we're trading off a small amount of environmental effect to have a better local economy. So it also gives you a very good communication tool. Um, this is another example of a project in Quebec with a, a, a very typical sort of startup uh, for a, this was a rare earth project where again you're faced with you know, where do I put my tailings. Um, what we did is we used the same decision analysis. We looked at four sites. Um, these were the obvious sites near the mine. We also looked at uh, slurry tailings versus filtered tailings. And again, we sat down with the mining company, developed all the parameters. Obviously, environment is one, cost is one, construction risks, operations risks, which is very cold climate. All of the concerns are represented in the decision-making tool. And uh, again, you get, you print out the answers. Uh, the computer is very helpful there. And you can see here the, the sites A, site A with the filtered tailings ranked the highest. And you can see why. The green bar was the ease of closure. Here, closure actually drove the preferred option, which is closing a filtered tailings versus the slurry tailings in a wet, very cold environment is considered a lot easier. Um, and again, it gives you a, a basis for making the decision. Also, it was considered to be easier to operate than a wet facility because of the freezing conditions. So tailings optimization. Um, these are just some recent developments. Um, one thing is, is what we're finding now is, is as you move forward, we don't look at just tailings on its own. It should not be looked at on its own. It should be looked at as an integrated system from your concentrator, your process plant, right through to your tailings dam, including closure of the tailings dam. Also, when we look at the process itself, um, there's different degrees of, of grinding. We can grind it to 70 microns. We can grind it to 90, 120. All of these things should be looked at in an integrated fashion. Because what you do in the concentrator, the amount of thickening you do, affects how you handle tailings, what type of facility you can build, what the cost of that facility is, and what environmental impact, and more importantly, what water you can recover from that facility if you're in a water-scarce area. The degree of grinding, the finer you grind, you may get increased recoveries, but your water recovery is going to be much more difficult. Tailings are going to stay saturated for a long time. So more and more companies are starting to look at this as an integrated system and optimizing that whole system, not just the tailings facility. And then the diagram on the right shows that in, in some instances, we're even starting to look at um, other effects of like greenhouse gas emissions. How different is each proposed tailings disposal option? How does it differ in greenhouse gas emissions and stuff like that? So there is a move towards sort of more integrated, systemized thinking on, on planning. Is there a computer we can press this? I think it's batteries. Oh, there we go. Tailings optimization. Um, some of the more classic, you know, ring dikes, um, where you're depositing from the dikes, pushing the water pond back for safety reasons. You end up with typical tailings facilities that look like that. Um, now, using thickened tailings, there's been a lot of development using thickened tailings, where we can actually create beach angles. Uh, this shows you those same two facilities how you can develop them with thickened tailings. This is, these are Australian examples where they've actually perfected a lot of the thickening tailings de depositions from the center of the facility, creating a slope of several percent, in this case up to 5%. You can see immediately the advantages. You have a free draining system for closure. It drains during operations. You get better water recovery, and your containment dams are much smaller, so you have a much lower capex cost. Uh, here's an example of where you start. You can do that in a linear fashion as well. And it shows you how you can do your water drainage with your perimeter dikes. 
This is an actual operating one. Um, the advantages of going to the stick and tailings deposit was that they, they had a, a, a draining feature that clo on closure w was easy to close, easy to drain. Um, and then they actually saved 80% of the embankment volume. They were able to build it at 20% of the volume, so 30 or 40% of the capex cost that was originally projected with conventional tailings. Uh, Esperanza Mine in Chile has done a lot of work. Uh, there's several papers been published on that um, with um, thickened tailings going up to 70, 75%. And again, I'm just, just, just raising this as a, not as a case history necessarily, but as a, as a state-of-the-art tailings facility design where you get into, it's not just done very lightly. I mean, there's a lot of science that goes into these things. There's a lot of thickening testing starting with you know, bench scales in the lab and then going to pilot scales in the field and running a pilot scale, you see the bottom right hand corner is actually a pilot scale test of the thickened tailings and then getting into the design and building of the new thickness. This, this project, this particular project, they were able to demonstrate that they could get much, much increased capacities on a sloping tailings facility and they're in the design stage, I believe, right now. They've gone through the feasibility stage. Uh, Racing mine. In, um, in Namibia, in Africa, is a classic example of going to thickened tailings and tailings management using uh, paddocks. Originally, you can see in the top right-hand corner, conventional tailings. Their water consumption, which is the key issue here in the desert, was at um, 1.2 cubic meters a ton. And then over the years, as they switched to dry, uh, thickened tailings, as they started building paddocks, smaller operating areas, over time, they were able to bring their water consumption down to 0.28. So that's a very, very significant reduction in water consumption by using thickened tailings and paddock deposition methods. Uh, Co-disposal, uh, again, is, 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 I think it's becoming more common at smaller mines. I think over time, we'll see more of it at larger mines. We're actually working on some very large mines billion plus tons that are looking at co-disposal. Um, this is a mine that was designed in Ontario. You can see the red layers were the layers of um, both acid generating rock and acid generating tailings that were deposited in layers. There's a dam on the left hand side there that is a water retaining dam so you can store water that would then cover that red deposit. So it covers your acid generating materials provides you with a chemical stability over the long term. Then you bring in your non-acid generating materials, your green materials, they are staged over the top of those uh, other materials. Here's one that was designed as actually operating in the Dominican Republic. Again, um, they went to cell construction, so again, they could promote deposition of tailings, acid generating tailings in the bottom and acid generating rock, and then move to another cell while this dried out and put uh, non-acid generating rock on top of the first cell. It shows you what it looks like in um, cross-section as well. Uh, so you can see the acid drain tailings behind the dam with acid drain rock and then the, and the sterile rock on top of that. And as I said, we are now working on some of these types of schemes for huge dams up to one or two billion uh, tons of ore. Uh, that just shows you a picture of the actual operation. So it's actually good that a lot of small mining companies have started innovating these that as we get confidence in these methods, we can take them up to the larger mines. ARD control measures. Um, as I said, this is going to be more and more important in the future. This is the first I know of where we've actually helped the, the customer develop a clay liner for an asset generating waste rock disposal facility in Brazil. You can see here the construction of the clay liner using the local available saprolites there. Um, show you the design concept. Um, this is a cross-section through what the waste dump is going to be, and it shows you we're starting to apply a lot more science and logistics to managing waste rock. The liner you saw is that bottom orange line, and it's there to prevent infiltration of acid uh, leachate during the operating period only. 
So when you start placing your waste rock, um, you have a clay liner underneath which prevents significant infiltration of acid flows. It's collected in this perimeter ditch, which is that gray line ditch there. And all the acid flow enters that ditch and is collected around the perimeter into a pond where it's either recycled or treated and discharged, depending on the water balance situation at that time. So you have active control of acid drainage. You're preventing acid from getting into the ground. And then on closure, you're closing the dump with a, a, a low permeability sapolitic cover again, uh, reducing infiltration. You retain those drains internally. So internally, any residual infiltration gets collected in those drains and reports separately as an acid flow. And then the runoff goes off the top clean. And the idea here is that over time, the infiltration will drop to a low enough level, the waste dumps will drain down, that that residual acid flow from those drains will be low enough to naturally dissipate through some natural wetlands and through dilution in the main rivers. South Africa, I won't spend a lot of time on that, um, has developed you know, some pretty unique approaches to their large tailings dams, um, building a starter dam, uh, internal drains. And what they do is they, as they, they, they started with a, with a starter dam and then they build it up with upstream uh, construction methods with cyclones. Um, they keep the inner tailings uh, saturated so that there's no acid generating in there. The outer tailings obviously are well drained because they're near the dam for stability reasons. And I'll show you they develop a integrated cover over that. So the drier tailings on the outside, as you build it up, your coverings, reducing infiltration, reducing the acid flux, the internal tailings are staying moist. So you're reducing the chemical reactions and in time you close it off and it's all free draining. You do get left with some residual flux which you have to accommodate in the natural environment. Conclusions. Um, there's, I definitely see there's an increased level of sophistication which, I, which needs, to, needs to increase. The, the integrated planning I see of, of great value both internally and externally. Life cycle cost evaluations, I just think by force economics is going to force us to get more into more complete life cycle. Eventually we try and optimize the whole mill through the tailings, through closure, through subsequent land use. Um, and then I think the most successful examples I've seen is where we have strong partnerships, both between, you know, within the mining companies, between mining companies, and between mining companies and their consulting or technical teams. And we often now even bring contractors right into the design meetings because we can't build it, we can't design it. Thank you. Speak in Hispanic. Seguimos con las preguntas. ¿Cuáles son los métodos más usados para la optimización de los relaves? Um, well, that's, that's a very broad question. <laughs> um, well, typically we would look at... Um, Typically, we would look at a, just to make sure we don't miss a tailings management option that, that is going to be important, we would look at a, a complete list for a given site. We would look at the types of sites that are available, their sizes and capacities. You can do that very quickly with some topography and some geology mapping. We would then look through a complete inventory of tailings deposition, starting from, you know, straight slurry deposition at 30% to to thickened at 60 or 70, to filtered at, you know, residual moisture contents of 15 or something. 
and we do um, an, an initial screening. We, we understand typically what the costs are. We can do an initial screening to see which ones make the most sense for that particular site. We'd also be looking at what our closure options are. And then from that, we would um, select, down select the two or three obvious sites that make the most sense and maybe one or two, maybe three alternative tailings management schemes. I've often seen us take through, say, conventional slurry um, and competed with thickened, or thickened competed with filtered. And then what we do is we develop a conceptual design, CAPEX and OPEX costs for those two or three options and then compare those both from an economic reason and then in some cases we'd go as far as using the decision analysis to factor in other things like you know, public perception, visual impact, uh, in the environmental effects. ¿Cuál es el factor más importante en el tratamiento de relaves? Well, I, I think there's costs are obviously still a driver and still very important. It is a competitive industry. Although I, I believe these days um, closure is probably the second greatest factor ease of closure, how you're going to close it, how you're going to maintain it in the long term. Um, there is, I think, going to be pressure developing against wet closure because of the continuous maintenance required for a water impoundment. Um, and then I guess the third is really dealing with, with, um, with the environmental and public, public uh, perceptions and effects, explaining to them how well, or how well it's been thought out and that it is going to be a safe safe approach. ¿Qué tipo de modelos, softwares, son utilizados para lograr la optimización de estos procesos? Well, the planning tool we use is a, is a software called Decision Criterion Plus. It's, um, it's a simple tool. The, the advantage of it is when you see all those decision boxes, you can you bring up one box at a time and you get your technical group or your decision-making group to opine on the, the ranking of the alternatives for that one particular parameter. You look at just CAPEX. You might look at just terrestrial environment. So it, it's very useful for focusing attention. Um, in, in many people use just conventional spreadsheets where they list all those parameters and they rank and weight them. So there, there's, there's multiple of tools that, that one can use. ¿Qué alternativas hay para evacuar el agua más rápido de, los re, de las relaveras y que éstas sean más pequeñas y no tan grandes? Sí, yeah, small. Typically, the, the tailings dam volume is fixed. It's, it, it, it has to equal the, the amount of ore you. Uh, process. You can obviously reduce its visual impact if that's important by adopting a flatter profile or putting it at a site which is less visual. It's actually interesting on one mine we're looking at in Alaska, they're, they're planning a new expansion in a new site and they're actually doing the visual assessments first before they even start selecting a tailings dam site. Um, methods of draining tailings. Um, they range, so there's a wide range. Obviously, you can do it in the process plant in thickness. Um, you know, various degrees of thickness go to deep cone uh, or to filtration, or belt filtration, then pressure filtration if you have to. In the tailings facility itself, uh, we, we've, we've done and looked at putting in drains in the facilities. We can put an under drain in, put the tailings on top, and then decant that water. There's some operational issues with that. Uh, it has to be designed right. Uh, Co-disposal, um, that Urban here has been involved with quite a bit, is another way of draining tailings where we push out, especially on smaller mines, you can push out waste rock and tailings at the same time. Waste rock provides a structure for draining the tailings. Um, in wetter climates, obviously evaporation is, is a method. Um, creating runoff, diverting runoff from inactive areas of the tailings facilities, again, is a method of preventing um, surface water from, from getting into your tailings water. And there's, there's probably several more. 
concluimos con las preguntas.